Listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're going to get into some great history today. There is a fantastic exhibit at Concordia Historical Institute, mm-hmm. and I'm excited to share that with you. I've been reading all about it online, but now <laughs> instead of just reading about it, we actually get to talk with the person who did all the work in it. So we'll share that story with you in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. Joining us today is Molly Lackey, social media and special projects assistant for Concordia Historical Institute located right here in St. Louis. Molly, welcome to the Coffee Hour. Thanks so much for having me, Andy and Sarah. It's, this is going to be fun because we get to talk history. Yes. Like this is right in line with like level of talking about hymns and stuff too. It we is. get excited it's about the history. It's the right nerdery right. level. I'm, I'm <laughs> so, here for this. Special exhibit <laughs> happening right. Martin Chemnitz at 500. And I got to say, he looks great for 500 years old. He does. So, <laughs> as well. Martin Chemnitz, the second Martin's life, work, and legacy. How Before we even get into his history, who is he? How did he get the name or the, the this this title, the second Martin? So the, the first Martin is hopefully fairly obviously Martin Luther. <laughs> and Chemnitz is known as the second Martin because Martin Chemnitz did a lot to sort of stabilize the Lutheran church after the deaths of Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon when there was a lot of controversy in Wittenberg and especially in the faculty there. There were a lot of theological controversies that started up within the Lutheran church towards the end of Luther's life and then really kind of accelerating after his death and getting even worse after Melanchthon's death. And Martin Chemnitz was really important in sort of helping the church figure out what it was going to do with all of these different controversies by really going back to scripture and also going back to the church fathers. And as a result, he ended up being very integral to the of the Book of Concord and specifically the formula of Concord, which was really created to sort of bring stability and clear answers to a lot of the theological topics that that were sort of dividing the Lutheran church at the time. So he's a pretty pretty important guy in our yeah. history. <laughs> yeah, he's a super important guy. And but a lot of people don't know that much mm-hmm. about him. Yeah. You know, he he has a really different sort of sort of writing style, theological style, I think, from either Luther or Melanchthon, and a really different sort of personality. I mean, he's he's very different from the first Martin, right? He's not this sort of bombastic, you know, like like big man, big hero of history kind of character. He was this sort of quiet guy. He was a librarian. And I think also a lot of his stuff hasn't been available in English as long as, say, Martin Luther or Philip Melanchthon's works have been. We've we've gotten a lot more stuff into English more recently, which the exhibit also talks about. The exhibit talks a lot about Martin Chemnitz's life and his work, but also what does Martin Chemnitz mean for us as Missouri Synod Lutherans and what has Chemnitz meant for other Missouri Synod Lutherans who came before us? So we'll get to all of that in a little bit more detail in just a minute, but let's go back to the beginning. Tell us about Martin Kendens' life, his kind of his upbringing, those types of things. What made him the person that he was? So Chemnitz grew up in this this kind of small town in Germany. He he was born in a a town called Treunbrietzen, and he had a couple of siblings. His family was involved in the cloth trade, which his older brother eventually ended up taking over. But Chemnitz was pretty shy. He he was kind of a nerd. He studied really diligently and and he didn't come from a lot of money, right? But kind of kind of like Luther, he's he's maybe sort of in this this you know, new-ish middling class. Mm. So he's a little bit more freedom than than previously like in the Middle Ages, but still it's it's pretty new, right? I don't think anybody in his family had had really gone to university or anything like that. And Chemnitz kind of jumps around between a whole bunch of different schools. He goes to Wittenberg for a little bit as a kid. He comes back. He goes to Wittenberg again. He comes, he goes somewhere else. He's, he's kind of all over the place. And he actually didn't study theology to begin with. He overlapped briefly with Luther, but he was actually studying mathematics and astrology at the time. Whoa. Yeah. So that was kind of weird. Yeah. He he did like horoscopes and stuff for big, important people like German dukes and stuff like that, which obviously, you know, we we would say that's that's a big no, no. But I, I guess they were still sort of figuring that stuff out and sort of the, the way that they saw it was, oh, well, God created the heavens and this is this is all OK. We would not 
really be okay with that now. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of a weird part of Chemnitz's life. And I think Chemnitz didn't really enjoy doing it. He just did it because he could make money at it, but while doing other things. So he's working as a librarian. He gets really interested in theology and he ends up sort of writing with Melanchthon and getting some advice on how to study theology on his own. And he's working as a librarian and he just goes at it. He he just sort of teaches himself like in, an encyclopedic amount of stuff from early church fathers and the scriptures. And he had kind of this this intense system of sort of like index cards or flash cards. So, you know, yeah, if there's any seminarians listening, <laughs> maybe this is a, a good good reminder that, you know, your flash cards do help you in the long run. Martin Chemnitz used them, so I guess they work. But um yeah, he was he was really kind of fairly self-taught. He ended up eventually going back and he he earns a, a master's degree, but a, a lot of it was was really just he was super studious and he just was super, super interested in learning this. And so he did. I mean, the, the convenience of being a librarian and then having access yeah. to all mm. the, the, the library. Yeah. And, you know, because of the printing press, libraries had really started to become something that was more feasible for mm. really wealthy government people to, to start running. And so he's he was at truly one of one of the most incredible libraries in Europe. I'm not I'm not sure that it exists anymore. I've I think I remember in there that it it was destroyed during World War II. Uh. But um, you know, at the at the time it was it was truly this incredible resource that really I don't think Europe had had really seen stuff like this before. But because of the printing press, because books are suddenly so much cheaper than they had been when, you know, you had to have a monk writing everything out, suddenly you can have these libraries and yeah, you can you can be an autodidact. You can you can, you know, do your library work and your your horoscope work in the morning and then spend the rest of, you know, the rest of your day just just reading Church Fathers. Fascinating. Anything else about the era in which he grew up? I mean, just knowing about the, the printing press makes a, I mean, that mm -hmm. that impacts society significantly. Anything yeah. else we need to know from the era in which he grew up? Yeah, so it's kind of fun. Chemnitz is born in 1522. So, you know, right at kind of the the height of when Luther is publishing, you know, Babylonian captivity, all of that, kind of the the run up with the Diet of Worms, all of all of this really intense period of of early reformer Luther. And yeah, so I'm I'm trying to remember a couple of I guess like 2 months before Chemnitz would have been born would have been when the September Testament came came out September in 1522. And so there's there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't really remember if he indicates it all in his autobiography. I I don't know that he was like raised Catholic. I think he could have been raised Lutheran. I think I think he is young enough mm. where he probably could have been immersed in that. But early, you know, early reformation is going on. There's there's this this huge outpouring of literature coming out of Wittenberg from Luther, from Melanchthon, you know, from pe other people like Bugenhagen, and it it was a it was a really kind of a, a perfect time for him to be born and for him to grow up in order for him to do what he ends up doing um, at kind of the height of his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of really formational stuff happening. Yeah. all at that time that that really would have been influential. Yeah. Um, what he wanted to really be. Because that was that was kind of what was ha just happening throughout all of culture at this time, too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> did he have a specific area of interest in study? I know we've, we've talked about the horoscopes <laughs> and the math, which is not super applicable to the Book of Concord. Yeah, and, right. And, yeah. and future writings. But when he gets into when does he get into theology and, and what is his uh, real area of expertise there if he has one? Yeah, so he starts getting really interested in theology once he becomes sort of like district president <laughs> of the German city of Brunswick. He's the superintendent, and that's in the late 1560s. And so that's really the period between 1555 until Melanchthon's death in 1586 was his most prolific period. Um, so one of the things that, that Chemnitz is most known for is his Loci Theologici, mm -hmm which is a commentary on Philip Melanchthon's Loci Communes, which I don't think we really do that kind of genre of writing anymore. So this is kind of a sometimes a foreign and kind of goofy sounding thing, I think, to contemporary listeners. But 
basically, um, low C communities means commonplaces, commonplace topics. And it was Melanchthon kind of going through everything in theology. It was very, very thorough. And then Chemnitz does a commentary on that, which is even more thorough. And there were some kind of issues that arose with Melanchthon during towards the end of his life where he started kind of going back and and editing things like the Augsburg Confession and sort of tweaking things because he was hopeful that Lutherans and Calvinists could kind of come and find a a common ground and and it it wasn't great. And so Chemnitz really liked Melanchthon. But what's really interesting about Chemnitz is Chemnitz tries to kind of correct what Melanchthon started to get wrong during the end of his life, but without I mean, frankly, without being a jerk about it, you know, Melanchthon was somebody who was really important to him and to a lot of people as a teacher and as a mentor. And so I think he he sort of wanted to do kind of like an like an eighth commandment treatment mm. of Melanchthon. And rather than than being really polemic, a lot of his writing really, really tries, if at all possible, to to avoid being unnecessarily confrontational or Pointed. He he reads really differently from from Luther, right? Who was who was really really concerned about about the truth, and it comes across in this really polemic way, which is useful in a lot of settings. But Chemnitz is is really dealing with kind of you know inside baseball stuff in the Lutheran Church, mm-hmm. where it would have been really divisive to start you know calling Melanchthon a heretic or something like that. <laughs> and he doesn't, right? He instead he just sort of fixes what was wrong and and goes on from there. I think another thing that Chemnitz was really interested in was Christology, and especially because Christology was such an important issue with what was going on between the Lutheran Church and the Reformed Church. There were a lot of Calvinists who were trying to challenge the Lutheran understanding of the Lord's Supper by going about it kind of from this Christological angle and by saying like, oh, well, if you believe in real presence, then then you're committing a Christological heresy and you're you're mixing up, you know, the the human nature and the divine nature of, of Jesus. And so Chemnitz has these really, really methodical Christological works that sort of address all of that. And then finally, what I think he was, one of the things he was best known for at the time, but that we don't spend as much time talking about now, was Chemnitz did a point-by-point refutation of the Council of Trent. Whoa. It is huge. It is a <laughs> huge, huge, huge document. But it was really, really significant. And I think it's still considered like the best Protestant response to the Council of Trent. So and all of that is available in English now, which is fantastic. We are learning about Martin Chemnitz, also known as the second Martin. Our guest today is Molly Lackey, social media and special projects assistant for Concordia Historical Institute. We're going to learn more about the special exhibit at Concordia Historical Institute in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are learning about Martin Chemnitz at 500, The Second Martin's Life, Work, and Legacy with Molly Lackey, Social Media and Special Projects Assistant for Concordia Historical Institute here in St. Louis. The history of Martin Chemnitz and all the details that you are pulling out for us is fantastic. And I I think we can learn, obviously, a lot more by participating in the exhibit, by visiting the exhibit and learning more that way as well. And I want to talk more about that in just a moment. But I could just tell by watching as you were describing all this that that you studied and learned about Martin Chemnitz that you were just engaged in this work. So what was the most interesting thing that you learned about Martin Chemnitz in your study? So Martin Chemnitz has an autobiography and... um, it's, I think it was something a, a professor at Fort Wayne way, way back, like 
maybe early 19th or not early, but sometime in the 19th century, maybe translated it. I can't find the original, but the English is it's a good translation. And in it, Chemnitz talks about this this weird little like childhood vignette. He's talking about like, oh, I was really shy and I didn't really like playing with the other kids. And instead, I I preferred to sit in a corner and talk to myself and I would make up little games with their own little rules that I would play with myself. And everyone else thought I was very strange. And I don't know, that's just such an odd, I'm, I'm so glad he included that. It's such a, it's such an, you know, wonderful little kernel of a detail about, about this man's life. Um, and something that I don't know that we necessarily get like that rich of a picture ever of Martin Luther's childhood, but it's just so odd. He also at one point describes he fell into a like a stream as a kid and it really freaked him out. He didn't he didn't like really hurt himself or even really get sick or anything. But it so badly freaked him out that he stuttered for years and had nightmares about it just because he had such a shock from it. So he seems to be kind of, yeah, this like kind of like nervous, shy child. And I'm I'm sure that, you know, that carried into his adult life. I, I think kind of his his whole personality of of yeah, being this librarian who just sort of sits and and writes this massive compendium of stuff about the early church fathers. It's you, you get a really kind of vivid image of what his personality was like. And it's such a different personality than I sometimes think we think of with reformers. Mm-hmm. We sometimes think of, you know, we have Luther on the one hand and we have Melanchthon on the other. Um, and I think Chemnitz is something different altogether. And I, I think it's really nice. It's, it's just really nice to have sort of heroes in our faith that we can look to and, and maybe identify with in some way. And I, I think that a lot of people can identify with, with Chemnitz's, you know, in, intense interest in theology and this, this, I, you know, kind of, kind of shyness, kind of nervousness. And also this this real desire to to learn no matter, you know, where he is and and use all of the resources that he has available to him. I think it's really fun to learn about the personalities of the people. Like we see their names and we're like, oh, yeah, that's a reformer. But it's so fun to to kind of know the, the person yes. and what their life was like. Yes. And, and maybe some of the influences that that kind of drew them into doing all of the the great works that we have from them now. It's just really cool. Yeah. It's so much fun. <laughs> so what what was Chemnitz's relationship to the Book of Concord and maybe some of those more familiar writings that we have in our in our Lutheran confessions? So Chemnitz helps write the Book of Con- the the Formula of Concord and is really in- involved in compiling the Book of Concord. So kind of one of one of the things that kicks it off is in the early to mid 1570s, there's a lot of controversies that are kind of tearing apart the faculty at Wittenberg and other Lutherans in in German states start hearing about it and start getting really concerned about the stuff that's coming out of the seminary in Wittenberg. And as a result, there's this increased interest in nailing down what Lutherans believe, because this has just kind of been the latest in in a pattern of behavior. And so they write the formula of Concord. Chemnitz and Jacob Andrea is also really important in this, as are Selnecker and a couple other names. But they write the formula of Concord to try to really harmonize what Luther wrote with what Melanchthon wrote and give a really, really final image of kind of what it means to be Lutheran and something that they can send out to all of the different Lutheran churches and that everybody can agree on. And if if you don't agree on that, okay, well, you're, you're not really Lutheran then. They they really wanted something definitive. And that was that ended up being what, what they did. It was sponsored by the Duke of Saxony at the time. It was sent out to everybody. And eventually they got enough people to sign on to it that it, it just sort of became binding. And, you know, the, the Book of Concord has remained really the, the thing that as Lutherans, right, we, we see as the definitive explanation of what we believe about Scripture, what Scripture teaches. And, I mean, it's, it's obviously a very important document because it's what all of our pastors subscribe to when they get ordained. So it's, it has really, truly stood the test of time within, within our Lutheran churches. 
So we can learn more about this by visiting the exhibit. Tell us more about the exhibit, how to find it. I understand it's digital as well. Yeah. So we have a small in-person kind of pop-up exhibit if you're in the St. Louis area. It's just in our lobby. It's totally free. We've got a couple of books out on display and a, and a couple of handouts. But if you're not in the St. Louis area, you can also view it because the almost all of the exhibit is available for free online on ConcordiaHistoricalInstitute.org. It's under the Exhibits tag, and up at the top on the menu is just Martin Chemnitz at 500. It's a it's a pretty exhaustive, I th- I think, exhibit. But I also think it's it's something that you know you you don't have to have a a ton of background in the Reformation. You don't have to have a ton of background about Martin Chemnitz to to enjoy it. We really wanted to produce something that people who had never really heard of Chemnitz or heard of him but didn't really know anything about him could use and enjoy and learn from. So, yeah. What does this cover in the exhibit? His his life, his work, his books? What kind of stuff will people find in it? So it's kind of in three big chunks. We have his life, which is just kind of a, a general biographical overview of of Martin Chemnitz and where he grew up and where he went to school and his family. And then we have his work, which just gives kind of a a really quick jaunt through the, the major works that Martin Chemnitz produced. And then we have his legacy, which really looks at how Synod Lutherans have engaged with Chemnitz over the years. And that's really where the holdings at Concordia Historical Institute kind of shine through. We've pulled some stuff from a a work of Chemnitz that was used by a seminarian at the St. Louis Seminary in the 19th century. We have some documents and stuff like that relating to J.A.O. Preuss's really fantastic translations of Martin Chemnitz. He kind of really got the ball rolling on on a lot of this Chemnitz translation work. And also, you know, some some stuff that has been translated after him with, you know, the the Chemnitz Works project that um, CPH has has done. I think I don't I don't know. I shouldn't say if it's complete or not. I don't know. But so so you can really kind of get a sense like okay, this this isn't just like some dead guy from the 16th century. This is somebody who is really really important to us as LCMS Lutherans, you know, as as Lutherans living in America in 2022. We still really value what Martin Chemnitz has done and what he has given to the church. Yeah, it's a very exciting exhibit. I I've briefly looked through it but boy there's there's a lot there what was what was your role in like pulling all this together how much research did you get to do to put this together so i think this took about 3 weeks so yeah i'm i am the social media and special projects assistant at concordia historical institute and we were planning out our uh, social media calendar and i realized that chemnitz's 500th birthday was coming up this was like the end of September. Oh boy. So yeah, I kind of kicked it into high gear and I've I've done some stuff with Chemnitz before, like when I was in college. And so I, I kind of pulled some of that, but so I, I knew where to look. Mm. But yeah, it was it was pretty much like two or three weeks of really intense reading and writing and putting putting the website together. And, you know, it 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 was a lot of fun, but it was <laughs> it was crazy. I was I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off through the archives. <laughs> I can relate to the looking at the calendar and then realizing something significant is yeah. coming up. And, like, oh, oh, we should plan that. We should do some history, <laughs> cover that. So, yep. Molly, it was just it was just a delight to have you here today. And now I know where we need to go when we want to take a look at some really cool history of mm-hmm. our church. Thanks so much for spending some time with us and sharing about the great exhibit. ConcordiaHistoricalInstitute.org is where you can find more information, right? Yes. Yeah, very good. And for listeners who like history like this, And they want to be a part of what's happening with CHI. Yeah. So we have lots of information about how you can become a member of Concordia Historical Institute. And it's really because of history lovers like you that we're able to do all of this stuff and, you know, produce all of this this great history and uh, honor the work of Christ among us in the Missouri Synod by treasuring and trumpeting the treasures of our church. Our guest today, Molly Lackey, social media and special projects assistant for Concordia Historical Institute. You can find more at concordiahistoricalinstitute.org. Thanks so much, Molly, for being our guest on The Coffee Hour. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. 
The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.